Lord bless you, brethren beloved. Welcome to Bible study one more time. It is a pleasure being here, and it is great having all the saints tuning in. Amen. God is good. He has been good to all of us, and he is to be praised, to be honored, to be lifted up, to be adored. We are going right into uh, study, and you would have known that we are on a two-week series. We started last week. We are going to wrap up this week. And we were looking into <clears throat> the old business of Jesus talking and outlining who we really are as children of God. He described us. He used elements that we are very familiar with, salt and light. And he describes us as being the salt of the earth and being the light of the world. And we had drilled down last week and look at some things associated with salt and associated with light. And what we got from the study last week is that we ought to be fully aware of who we are, what are supposed to be the characteristics of the true child of God. If we are going to be salt, what is it that salt does? Are we doing that in the space that we occupy? What is our impact on the peoples of this world that we associate with, that we encounter? Are we, as salt, getting onto the... Because if salt is really going to work and serve its purpose, it has to mingle. It has to be rubbed up upon the fish or the meat or whatever it is that it is um, to give savor to is to season it has to be rubbed into the thing and so there has to be that interaction yes uh, how are we in terms of our interaction with the people that we encounter day by day can they feel the seasoning effect it is very important that we understand these things because that and these are the things that actually show us who we really are and indicate to us uh, on that scale where we are. And it is very important, beloved, that we understand and recognize where we are. We don't want to be in a situation that we are there carrying on and going through the motion, but we are out of contention for the prize that is to come. So these lessons are really to inform and to inspire our hearts and our minds and to cause introspection so that we can make the adjustments and be who we ought to be as true children of God. Having looked at salt, we looked at light, and we are saying that, listen, at the end of the day, if we are supposed to be light, and we are not shining, something is wrong. It is either the switch is not working, and the switch, we can talk about the switch as being heaven, not working to switch the light on. It is either the switch is not working, is that it is either that the power is gone, it is that or that the light bulb is blown. And beloved, there is nothing wrong with the power source because that is coming from heaven above. So what is important is for us to check to see if our bulbs have been blown, if they need to be changed. And sometimes we have light and when the switch is flicked, the light is so dim and we better be very careful. And I'm talking to all of us. I want us to know. So as we look at the thing, what is actually happening is that it is highlighting it is presenting to us what ought to be, and it exposes us because we might see ourselves not being at the place where we should be because if salt is supposed to be doing this and we are not, we are really not salted. And Jesus had a, a rebuke for that, you know, because he said if the salt has lost its savor, where we, we, shall it be salted? And if it can be salted, if it has lost its savor, he said it is good for nothing. And then he went on to say, you know, men ought to trample on it 
And then he finished his statement with a, a word of caution, a, a, a frightening word of caution. Whoso have hears, E-A-R-S, let him hear. And that's a, that, that's a very somber way to finish a, a discourse. And it is saying that this matter is serious. Don't take it lightly. I'm submitting to the church of the Lord tonight. I'm submitting to the body of Christ. I'm submitting to you, beloved. Let us not take this thing lightly. If we are light, let us generate light. We can't light a candle and put a bushel or a basket over it. It does not make sense. If we are going to be light, let us be light. But we can't proclaim to be light. And yet we are hidden. Darkness and light do not mix. So these lessons are real life lessons and down to earth lessons that helps us to introspect and to see where we are. And the, the warning is men do not like Changla. Cover it. Something is wrong with that narrative. And so we want to use the opportunity to, to, to have all of us to introspect. You know, doing the lessons exposes us. And nothing is wrong with exposure. Exposure. When we are genuine, when we are honest, when we are open, and decide that having been exposed, I need to make adjustments. That is what it is all about. It's not to cut and to tear and to stamp down. It is to expose. And all of us need exposure from time to time. It helps us to keep on the line, to keep on the straight and narrow. And I am here to assist in that process. Hence these kind of lessons. And so that is what we should get coming out of that. But what I do not want is to expose the thing. And then we are naked before God and we are uncertain what to do and I want to use the time this evening having gone through what we gone through last week to drill into some critical areas that will help us in our walk so that we don't have our lights dimming and going out so that we don't have our saltness disappearing and we become good for nothing. It's one thing to bring the exposure, but it is another thing to examine some things. And we are going to use this evening and examine some things. I wonder how many of us know that Satan, because he knows that the true Christians, the genuine Christians, have to walk a certain path. He knows it. Many genuine Christians know it. But then you have Christians that are on the periphery who are unaware in their minds they go to church and they are involved, but they are unaware that if they are not being true lights and if they are not being true salt, then what is going to happen? They are good for nothing. They are going to be trampled and they are going to be lost. We have to understand who we are and if we are the light of the world, we must be the light of the world. We cannot be called a name and we don't uh, perform the things that distinguishes us in the way that Jesus describes us. I find that Jesus used these everyday things to describe who we are and how we are to operate so that we get it clearly in our consciousness and in our hearts, in our understanding. He knows how important it is. And we ought to appreciate and understand the importance. I fear that many of us who have the intention of making it into the rapture and seeing and being with the Lord Jesus Christ, I fear that there might be some who just take it lightly and believe that by just turning up on a Sunday, by just turning up into Bible study, by just saying I am a Christian in name is enough, by just simply saying a prayer every now and then or even if we do it every day and that is all it is to make it into the kingdom of God. I fear that some folks have been somehow persuaded otherwise than as the word of God is presented to us and to that extent, 
We believe that it is a walk in the party. It is not difficult. It is not a burden. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. He has given it to us. But that, that he has given to us requires us to walk a certain way and to have our lifestyle, you know, under a certain kind of uh, covering and to live and to display who we are and whose we are. And it is important that we see that, we recognize that, and we live in that way. Do not treat your salvation lightly. Do not just go through the process, beloved, and, 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 and follow the norms. It is important that we learn the thing and take note and build our knowledge of who we are and what we are supposed to do. My people are destroyed because of lack of knowledge. And I want us to know the fundamental things and I want us to take the time out to look. And the scriptures is replete with information. If we go to the Old Testament, I hear the, and see the writer, the wise man writing in the Proverbs and he took note of the ants and he took note of the pony and he, he, he took note of just some simple creatures in the wild and use it to open up some light and we are going to go into that into studies to come things that are simple things that are every day out there the bible goes through great lens to use them to illustrate so that we can discern and we can pull and we can apply and live we have too much information too much at our disposal Old Testament and New Testament, too much things that Jesus used to show us so that we can fully understand and, our, and apply our hearts to wisdom and apply our hearts to knowledge. Beloved, take heed of these things. Now, I, I want us to know that Satan knows the kind of life that we are to live as Christians. So he, as a result, do things to derail us. He does things to get us off track. He does things, and when he do these things, he, and he sees that we are off track, we are derailed, then he's happy with that. He, like us, is on a drive to get new disciples. We are discipling and bringing them into the kingdom of God. He's discipling them to get them out and I want us to understand that people who we see leave this faith and just get up and walk and gone back into the world as if they have gone back to the, their vomit. You need to understand that they don't even realize what they are doing and what they have gone back to because Satan has blinded their eyes. He has deceived them. And that is his strategy. He works his thing a certain way. And if we are supposed to be salt, he makes it look as if salt is not important. And, oh, you're not, you don't need to do this. If you're supposed to be light, he said, there can be other lights. You don't have to be doing this and that. He dims the thing and he causes shadows to fall over them so that you don't see the importance of performing and doing and being the person that Jesus said you are to be. And if you are to be salt, be salt. See what salt is supposed to do apply it to our lives and do it. See what light is supposed to do, the characteristics, apply it to our lives and do it. That's why these scriptures were given. That's why Jesus took the time to do all that he did and make it clear and concise so that we can embrace it and apply it and live it. Beloved, it is important, it is important. We want to see the king. And we've got to do it the right way. Don't make those who don't take time out and look into the word beguile you. Don't make those who are not sheep but are wolves in sheep clothing, clothing. Don't let them beguile you, brethren, beloved. Take the time and go through the word. We started on this. Look again and see what it is that we are supposed to do to be salt and to be light. And let's do it. Let's do it together. Do not waste time. Do not take these things lightly, beloved. 
And so we are going to, that being said, we are going to go into some other areas. And the areas that I'm going to go into now, having exposed the thing and exposed us, we are going to look and identify what Satan is doing. Because what he's doing, he is pulling a wool over the eyes so that we don't see the urgency or the necessity. We don't see the need to be as deep in our walk as we are supposed to be. And we are going to find that Jesus used some words as we go through this thing in describing the unsaved. He's, got, he's saying, look, you guys taking this thing lightly, you know. Do you know that the, the unsaved, the people in this world are wiser than the children of light? And why would Jesus say such a thing? Because here it is that people who have met the true and living God, people who have met the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, here it is that they have received that thing which will take them to no other place but the home of the soul. They have tasted of the greatness of heaven. And having tasted that, it's just a matter of time. They get dislodged. They are refocused. They are looking at other things. And the things which matters most gets the least attention. Something is not wrong with that signal, with that narrative, with that picture, with that frame. The things that matters most, beloved, ought to get the most of our attention and the most of our time. And the things that matters most we are seeing in Christendom today gets the least of our time. Can't we see that that is a trick of the enemy and that we ought to change that script and remove that frame and set the thing right where well, we are going to expose so the scriptures that we have looked at in saint matthew that speak about salt and light and open our eyes and exposes us we are going to now expose satan and show you how and what he's doing to cause you to lose sight of who you are and cause you to be distracted and pay little regards, can't regard to being who the Lord says you are to be, salt and light. Why are we not the salt of the earth as we are supposed to be? Why are we not the light of the world as we are supposed to be? Our eyes are blinded and we are going to take time and look at some scriptures, look at what is happening, fix that thing so that we be the tops and we be the person who we ought to be as children of the Most High God. So we are going to go into it now and we go to the first slide as we just take a look as we expose the trappings of Satan and expose what he is doing to cause distraction and to cause us to be weak and to cause us to be weary. I'm going to use some little scriptures, simple scriptures, and bring out some points so that we can see who we are and shape up. If we are to be light, we must be light. If we are to be salt, we must be salt. If we are to be sheep, say he describes us as sheep, we must be sheep. And I want us to understand these principles. They are simple, but they are deep. And we don't just want to be exposed, but we want to find the road that takes us to where we must be so that we become who God wants us to be, who we are supposed to be, and we can be assured that we are on our way to the place, the home of the soul. So we continue with being the salt, being the light, but from a different perspective now, what Satan is doing to stop you from being salt and being light. And having seen that and being exposed to that, we take some steps, the necessary steps, and become who God wants us to be. Anything outside of that will cause us heartache, pain, and suffering. Not only in this life, but in the life to come, Mark my words so it's very important beloved so we look at the way we're going to go through now as we get into 
the presentation. We're looking at some, we're looking at some slides. So we just want to fix the screen so that um, we are not expected to hide our baskets. I just went over all of that. I just went over all of that. And having said all of the things that I have said, I want us now to understand, beloved, that our lives literally, literally bring glory to Almighty God. This is what we are doing when we are identified as the salt of the earth, when we are identified as the light of the world. In, in, if, if we are true salt and if we are true light, then we bring glory to Almighty God through our lives by the way that we live. It is our deeds. Let your light so shine before men that they may see, not hear, but see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So we must be very sensitive to the presence of God, beloved. We must be very sensitive to what God wants us to be. And we must be very sensitive to who God wants us to be. And he has described us, yes? So I, I, I submit to us that we ought to be guarding our hearts so that our lives are salted, are flavored, so that our lives shine forth with the light that Jesus intended it to have. And notice I say, guard our hearts. That is fundamental. That is foundational and it is critical that I, I, I want us to, and I should have actually underlined that those, those first three words, guard our hearts. is the same thing as saying guard our minds. Is the same thing as saying guard our thoughts. Very, very significant. Heart, thoughts, mind represents the same thing. And we're going to point it out and show us. But it is important, beloved, that we do these things. It is important that we guard the heart. There is a scripture, and see, it, it is underlined for us there in red. Remember, I have said this, guard our hearts. It is fundamental. There are some things that every child of God should be keenly aware of. Very important, fundamental, crucial principle that allows people to overcome. A very crucial principle that determines those who excel as children of God and those who fail. And for whatever reason, these things are out there, but folks just don't seem to appreciate it. And we're going to kind of put it into perspective uh, in our study this evening so that we can appreciate that if we are going to be flavored or salted, and if our lights are going to shine, and if we are not going to look at these things that they, they become like mirror to us and shows us that we are naked, it is important important that we guard our hearts and this is fundamental this is crucial to the child of God that is going to be successful the Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 33 it says this keep your heart with all diligence keep your heart <coughs> sorry with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. Another translation, another translation, another translation puts it this way, above all else, guard your heart, for it determines the course of your life. Now, this is a powerful statement. This is something that I want us to never allow to leave our minds, our consciousness, our entire being this is something that must captivate us above all else guard your heart for it determines the course of your life we're going to see how powerful this is and this is something for whatever reasons i do not know but saints just miss this concept they have just missed this principle and this is a powerful principle that will keep us in in check will keep us in line, will keep us in order. And having said that, 
I want us to understand something that Jesus is saying here. We need to know who we are, you know. We need to understand. Jesus, Jesus made a profound statement in Matthew 10 and verse 16. Yes? He said, Behold, I send you forth a sheep in the midst of wolves. Be therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. This is, this is very significant, beloved, because here Jesus, here Jesus is telling us, right, to be wise. He's telling us to be innocent, harmless. It is important that we understand the depth of what Jesus is saying. Be wise as serpent. Do you understand, beloved, that many in the kingdom are unwise? Many in the kingdom don't understand that we have to apply wisdom in our everyday walk with God. When we talk about reading the Bible and doing things, you know, it is crucial and it is so important. But then if we are going to put all the pieces together, yes, it's about reading our Bibles, yes. Yes, it's about praying and fasting, yes. But then when we look at the scripture, uh, what we looked at last week, we see some additional things. And these are not onerous. These are not burdensome. But we see that we ought to be salt. So it's not just only about holiness and reading Bible, the Bible and praying and fasting. But there is, is a part of our walk with God that is so important. It is how we impact people that are around us. That's where the salt comes in. It is how we impact people around us. That's where the light comes in. And Jesus is saying, listen to me, you are sheep in the midst of wolves. What wolves do is tear the sheep to pieces. And so if you are going to survive, Jesus is coming down to the grass tax now and saying, look here, you are being hounded. You are being hunted down. You are sheep in the midst of an environment that is seeking to tear you to pieces. And if you're going to survive, if you're going to make it, if you're going to remain and be in the flock and not be torn apart and drawn aside, you're going to have to be wise. You're going to have to be wise and wisdom is the all mark of the child of God. So being wise, look again what he has done. He has used an animal from out in the wilderness, a serpent. He said, be wise as a serpent. What does that mean? And then be harmless or be innocent as a dove. What does that mean? Again, Jesus is illustrating some things. And because he wants us to understand and to be sure that we know what we are about, he uses things to bring across a deep message. He uses these illustrations to bring across the deeper meaning so that we can understand what he is saying and apply it. Don't just read the scriptures and gloss over it. If he says to be wise as a serpent, how many of us have taken the time out to say, what does that mean? How is a serpent wise? As far as I know, a serpent is a wicked portrayal of what is wise about a serpent. But it was Jesus that said it. So there had to be something about a serpent that was wise, that Jesus said be wise as a serpent. What is it about the dove? Why did he say be harmless or be innocent about as a dove? If we are going to grow and if we are going to advance in our walk with God, we need to appreciate these little things that Jesus is saying. They might appear at face value to be simple, but they have deep meanings and we must extract the meanings and embrace them and apply them that is what is going to help us to be who he wants us to be and notice Jesus uses simple things that all of us can appreciate all of us can embrace all of us can understand so let's look back at that scripture again and let's dissect it Matthew 16 um, let us dissect it let's look back at that scripture again and and then we go into dissecting it. Be, yes, Matthew 10 and verse 16. Behold, I send you forth a sheep in the midst of wolves. Be therefore wise as serpents and 
armless as dove. What, what does this really mean? What is it that, what's the gist, what's the essence of what G, it is that Jesus is saying here to us? What can we basically extract from that? It is simply saying to us and simply requiring of us, beloved, that we be prudent in all that we do in our walk with God, in our pursuit for everlasting life, in our pursuit for the things that are eternal. Brethren, we must be prudent, we must be conscientious, we must be serious, yes, in all that we do in this life. And we must, and this flows over into our being mindful of each other, yes, as we walk with the Lord and as we pursue eternal things, as we pursue things that has eternal value, we must understand that we have to be mindful of each other and how we affect each other. Yes, so in our walk, as we be wise, as we be harmless as doves, as we be wise as serpent, basically Jesus is saying, apply these two things and be prudent in what we do as we pursue spiritual things. Be prudent how we walk with each other, how we interact, how we support. Be careful. And this is whether spiritually or physically, you know, because we can harm people spiritually. I have heard folks saying they're not coming back to church because of how people have treated with them. Of course, there's always two sides to a story and, and a knife can have two sharp edges. Nobody's supposed to walk away from the presence of the Lord simply because of things that somebody say or do. But at the same time, some people don't even realize that Satan uses them as instrument to hurt and to crush people. And so if we are going to make it, if we are going to be sheep living in the midst of wolves, things trying to tear us apart, we must be careful, be prudent in our, prudent in our walk, and we must be careful how we work with and support and interact each other spiritually and physically. It is very important. So the essence of what Jesus was saying there is to be prudent in everything that we do in our walk with God. Very important. And Paul picks it up in Romans. And he was going through talking to the Romans. And he, he made this profound point. But yet, this is the latter part of verse 19, I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple or innocent or harmless concerning that which is evil. And the New Living Translation interprets it and makes it a little clearer to us. I want you to be wise in doing what is right and I want you to be innocent of any wrong. In other words, we have to be very careful, beloved, that we navigate our steps properly. And in order to properly navigate, there is an element of wisdom that must resonate with the saints of God, with the children of God. It is important that we understand that. I want us to know, be wise in doing right and stay innocent of any wrong. It is very, very, very important. Wisdom, buy it and not sell it, beloved. Wisdom, don't let her run away from you. Wisdom, seek it, seek her, embrace her and love her. If we are going to make it, we have to embrace wisdom, especially in these times. Wisdom causes us to understand that Satan hates us and he is like the wolf that is mentioned in the scripture. We are the ones that are sheep and we must use wisdom to know and to discern because wisdom, if we have it in our, in our bosom, will help us to discern when things that look nice is poison. Wisdom helps us to know when things that look pretty is ugly. Wisdom will allow us to know that when we see a sheep or think what is sheep, it is actually a wolf in sheep clothing. Wisdom bites, 
brethren beloved, and do not sell it. So here Jesus is saying, first, in the scripture in St. Matthew 10 and verse 16, be wise as a serpent. But here Paul takes it up in Romans and says, I wish you were wise in, so, in the things that you are doing. And the same scripture that Jesus used in Matthew 10 and verse 16, wise as a serpent, harmless. That word harmless is the same word that they use as innocent. Innocent as a dove. Paul uses the same two words in Romans that we just read. That the saints be wise and that we be innocent of evil. In other words, set aside yourself from getting intertwined with things that are evil and will tear us down. But he started out by saying, be wise. Is it that Satan has so beguiled us and so deceived us that we have reached the point where we have let go of wisdom? Is it that we have reached a point where we have released wisdom from our bosom and so we are just going around saying I am a Christian and I am apostolic and I am this and I am that but we have no deep wisdom to help us to navigate and to discern things and to dissect things and see when entrapment is there for us what has happened to the true child of God why is it that we seem to be so unwise in the things that we do to the extent that we are no longer lights in our community, to the extent that we cannot intermingle with people and we influence them? Have you realized, beloved, that if salt goes on to meat, it salts the entire thing? But for the saltness to take place for the thing to be seasoned and to be flavored and to be salted. You have to rub the salt over that entire thing and then it is seasoned. But notice what is happening to many of God's people who are supposed to be Christians. Instead of us salting the earth, influencing the earth, seasoning the earth, guess what is now happening? Because of lack of wisdom. We, have no, we are now in a situation where the earth is salting us. We are now being influenced by the world. We were supposed to salt the world, meaning we are supposed to be the influencer. We are now the ones that are being influenced. Wisdom seems to have fled from us. How and why? And I want us to understand that we need to turn the script now. I want us to understand that if we are not salt and if we are not light, if our lights are out, if our lights are dim, if our salt has lost its savor, we are in problem. I put that to us bluntly and plainly. We are in a pickle. And evidently we have lost our saltness. And, and so we somehow have allowed wisdom to flee from us. But let's look back at the scripture now. And it says, I want you to be wise. I want you to be innocent. I want you to be, I want you to understand as you do the things that is supposed to be right and pleasant in the eyes of Almighty God, be wise in your execution and, and be, 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 be very mindful Yes, be very mindful of the things that will cause you to stray and avoid them. Be innocent, be, be, be detached from those things. And that is extremely important. Now, there is a scripture that I want us to find. I, I should have had it there uh, on the screen for you. I'm going to have the producer just to bring it up. Luke, St. Luke chapter 16 and verse 8. And it comes in to sharp focus because what is re the reality what is it that is actually happening to us right now? Yes, we are supposed to be wise. And we are supposed to orchestrate our walk and, 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 and set ourselves in a certain way. But what is the reality? 
This is what Jesus said, and Jesus made a very profound statement. And it, it, it is frightening. He said, and the Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. The unjust steward, you know, brethren, beloved, the unjust steward, the Lord of the vicinity, con con commended the unjust steward. Why did he do that? Because he had done wisely. And then Jesus made a very profound statement. And I, I don't want us to lose sight of this now because we're getting a little deeper into this thing. Jesus made a very profound statement. He said, for the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. Now, that, 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 that is almost like a rebuke. Very deep, very profound. He said, the children of this world are in their generation wiser, what, than the children of light. Now, let me give you a background to this scripture. Let me give you a background to this scripture so that you can um, appreciate where this whole thing is coming from and why Jesus made this very, very profound statement. The Bible tells us of this ruler, uh, this particular landowner, a rich man, and he left and went to a particular place. But I didn't really go into the details. It simply just said that he got report that the steward that he had that was managing his estate was doing some things out of the way. And the ruler quickly jumped onto it and said, I'm going to get to the bottom of this. And he sent for the steward. He sent word for the steward to come to give an account of his stewardship. So the steward realizing that indeed he was defrauding the ruler and realized that he was in trouble and knew that he was going to be fired. Say, you know what, Gee, Lord, look, look what may happen to me. But if him fire me, all those people that I was doing these things with, I am going to get to them right now and work out something with them that I am in their eyes a good steward to them and a good boss to them and a good businessman to them. What he did, he went to a, a particular individual who had a hundred measures of oil. And he called up the man and said, look here, what is it that you owe me? And the man said, look here, I have a hundred measures of oil that I owe you, and I'm going to pay you, you know, but, and you know, they, in the course of business, they would have been talking and negotiating. He said, hear me now, all right. You have a hundred measures of oil, tell you what. Consider say you're gonna owe me 50. Pay me for the 50. We work out something, man. And, and I'm just paraphrasing because this is just businessmen talking. You know, I think you probably have it hard and uh, things difficult to do. But the man who is talking to doesn't know that he's using Sykes because he's trying to get into his good book. Because he knows that in a little while he might be fired. And he might very well have to go back to some of these business people and say, you know, I'm no longer there, but remember, I used to work good with you. That's the essence of what was happening here, you know. So he went to another one, and that man said, I had a uh, hundred measures of wheat. You know, because he said, what you owe me? He said, boy, right now I owe you a hundred measures of wheat. And probably in the discussion, say, boy, I can't talk to you right, I can't pay you right now, you know. But just give me a little time, then say, all right, tell you what. You don't have a hundred. Consider say you're going to owe me for 80. Come and work out something. And, and believe you me, the man work with the man who had a hundred measures of oil and say you owe me 50. That means him right half. Half of what was owed. Him work with the man that had a hundred measures of wheat and said, look here, you're going to owe me 80%. Right half the other 20. You know what automatically happened there, beloved? Those men that got their debts written down, 
see him in a different light. They are going to consider him kind, thoughtful, a good businessman, somebody that I can work with in the future. They don't know that he was doing that for his own benefit because he's in trouble with his master. And Jesus looked at that situation, at that scenario, and used that parable to bring across a point. He said, you see how the people of this world operate? They know what is to be done. They know what is important. They know how to safeguard themselves. They know if when trouble come, what it is that they must do. That is a wise man. So he's wise in the context of what is good for him. He's a worldian. He's a man that only knows business. His major concern is money. And based on that, he did everything to put himself in the good book of those other men because they are going to have to turn around and help him in a little while. And Jesus used that to say, you see that? The people of this world, in their generation, they are wiser than the children of light. They know how to assess a situation. They know what to do to put first things first. They know how to examine something and say, this is going to cause chaos and confusion and I'm going to be put out of a job. And they know how to manipulate the thing and maneuver themselves and put themselves in a way that they have to the extent that the ruler saw him and said, but this is a good businessman in as much as he has done this. Brethren, beloved, if Jesus said the children of this world is wiser than us, something is very significant there that we must not overlook. So let's look back at the slide now, and we're going to extract something additional so that we can be clear in our minds that the lack of wisdom, yes, is at the heart of the kind of a lackluster life that many of us are living as children of God. We have soul wisdom, and we are unable to discern between good and bad, and we are unable to discern that a particular road is going to lead us to hell, and we are unable to discern wisdom has fleed from us. Jesus is saying, people in this world wiser than me, that don't sound good. People in this world are wiser than you, based on how they see things and what they place as priority. So we're, we're drilling down, and let's look at the slide now and drill a little bit further down. What is it that is, is coming out from the scripture? Jesus is saying that they are meticulous, and, and this is the, what comes out of it. They are meticulous about the things that matters most to them. That is the essence of what Jesus is saying, you know. Though they are in the world and they are outside of the realm of being my people, but in the world, they know what matters most to them. It is money. It is business. It is the, the cares and the things of this world, the things that Satan has placed into the consciousness of men and said, this is what is most important. And here is a man in the world system that has in front of him what is most important. And to them it is their financial resources and getting rich and having all the things of this life. The man with the barn say, I'm going to tear down my barn and make a bigger barn. And then I'm going to say, thou soul rest and be at ease. Because he has what he wants. That's what matters the most to him. To get a bigger barn and then go relax. And Jesus is saying that these people are wise. Thought, because they are meticulous about the things that matters most to them. They are prudent in managing their resources to be at their peak. That is what happens to the man out in the world. If, we're his, if when, what he's concerned about is getting his money, what he's concerned about is having his business being on the top. Yes, that's what he's concerned about. And here it is that we, as children of God, we know what is most important to us. What is most important to us as children of God? We know that. We have that set. 
we are clear in our minds as to what that is. And yet, unlike the man in the world, we are not meticulous about ensuring that we are on top of things. No, we are not. We are not managing ourselves and what we have properly so that we can be at the peak of our Christianity. No, we don't. We don't. What is it that is crucial? What is it that is at the heart of at the mindset of the child of God? For the people of the world, it is what they can get down here. Money and house and land and business and care and for the men, girls, and for the, the ladies, men, and those things. And they'll go out of the way and they'll be meticulous as they put these things together. But for the child of God, what is most important to us is our having that deep-rooted walk with Almighty God and our making it into that place called heaven and our being a part of the body of Christ. That is what is most important. But we are not meticulous at all about putting things in place and walking in a certain light and ordering our steps. We are not meticulous. On the contrary, we are careless. On the contrary, we are just casual. The people of this world are prudent in managing their resources to be at their peak. We know what is required to be at our peak and we are just lackadaisical and we are just out of it and Anything happens and anything goes, and that is absolutely terrible. And I say that to all of our shame. I say that to all of our shame. And for Jesus to have made that statement, for Jesus to have made that statement, it was significant, and we ought to take stock of that. Do the things that we must do. Be prudent have wisdom, apply our hearts unto knowledge. Yes? And I say this to our shame. We, we, we take this thing too lightly. We allow the influence of the world, who Jesus says, wiser than the children of light, to our shame. And we allow them to influence us instead of we influence them. Why? Because they are more prudent in their pursuit for what they think is most valuable. And yet for what we know is most valuable, we know it, it's most valuable. What do we do? Nothing. We don't pray. We don't fast. We don't read the world. We argue with our brethren. We, 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 we despise leadership. We despise instructions from the Bible. We do everything. I do not know, but I want us to know now that this didn't just happen like that. There is something behind the child of God who operates in that way, and that's where we're going to drill into, you know. So I'm, I'm presenting these things to us, beloved, so that we can get down a little deeper into where this mindset is coming from that caused us to pay scant regard to what is important. It don't just happen like that. To cause us to go sleep when it's prayer time. It don't just happen like that. To cause us to sleep when we are in church. It don't just happen like that. Brethren, there is something behind that things happening in that way. And I want us to understand what is at work. So we, and I'm teaching us, so I'm talking about us, we must not be in that category of people that it be said the children of this world is wiser than us. We want to turn that script. We want to not be in that group. And we want to set the record straight. We want to be wise as serpent and we want to be harmless as dove. How does that happen? What does that mean? Let us look at it. Let's, let, let's revisit St. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 16. And, and then we catapult um, along. Yes? So let us do that and, and drill down um, a little bit deeper. So let's go back to Matthew chapter 10 and verse 6. Yes, it's, it said that we must be wise. We must be very careful. Yes, 
we must, be, we must ensure that we are wise as serpent and we are harmless as dove. Now, what is it, beloved, that makes the serpent wise? What is it, beloved, that, that, that we, what is it about the serpent that we can see and kind of come to the conclusion that why would Jesus say be, 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 be wise as a serpent? Now, many of us, as we think about the serpent, for sure, we know that the serpent is one of that, that creature that you know, avoid at all costs. It was the serpent that in Genesis in the Garden of Eden that caused all the calamity that we are experiencing even today as humankind. And so the serpent is that, you know, creature that we must revile at all times and we must make sure that we stay far from and people are just scared of and people will go to the, the zoo to see a lion and run up roaring and all that kind of thing but when they're passing where the snake is they barely even want to look in there so there's a snake going to stretch out his tongue and sting them even there they just have this fear of the serpent and when you think about serpents you're thinking about you know trickery and guile and evil and it is associated with darkness and underworld activities and so forth. Why would Jesus then say be wise as a serpent? It, it is simple, beloved. There is something about a serpent. When he's in a certain environment, he is so aware and discerning when danger is approaching that he quickly draws away. And before you know it, he slithers away. And you can't even see him. You can't catch him to kill him. So he will be going along. And before you know it, you're hiding and you're coming. And he is so sharp in discerning movements and understanding what is happening in his environment. He's so aware of the environment around him, whether up in a tree or way down behind or upper front. He is so keen at identifying danger and slithering himself away so that he can hide or slithering himself away into the bushes and just mix with the environment. In other words, no matter where, he can settle into any kind of environment. So if it is a, the desert, he just camouflages and you just look around and you just think you're seeing pure sand. He somehow blends into the environment. If it is in the wilderness, he just slithers away when he senses danger and he camouflages in the bush or the grass or wherever he goes. He knows how to quickly identify danger. He knows how to discern when something is wrong and take himself away so as to be protected that he can live to fight and to hunt and to kill another day. That's the wisdom of the serpent. Not the evil and the other things, because Jesus wasn't talking about those other traits, but he was talking about the fact that the serpent is able to discern quickly when something will harm him and pull away or blend into so as to cause the danger to pass. And that is significant, beloved. That is extremely significant. That is something that we ought to pull from what Jesus Christ is saying. That is something that we ought to appreciate and apply to our personal situation. We ought to be discerning. We ought to be aware of our environment. We ought to be aware of what is happening around us. We ought to be so keen so that we can be wise enough to know that that person who is pretending to be a friend is not your real friend. They want to pull you out of what you are in so that your neck can be chop chopped off. You can't easily catch the serpent in that way for as dangerous as he is otherwise he has that discerning nature about him. And we have it, but we don't use it. We are not wise 
We have soul wisdom to the extent that we can assess a situation. We can discern the environment. We don't realize that the person who is pretending to be your friend is not your friend. He is an instrument of Satan sent to pull you out, sent to cause you to be lukewarm, that you lose your focus and lose your passion for the things of God. Jesus uses the things that we know about creatures around us so that we can understand what we are up against. So he says, be wise as a serpent. Know your environment. Know where you are. Know what is happening at school. Know what is happening at the workplace. The people who are making the, 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 the dance or session look like it is just interaction with the workplace. That is not your space. And we must know when they are trying to bring you into something to, to pull you out and to get you away from where you are supposed to be. And they'll talk nice and they'll talk pleasant and they'll say it is just normal interaction. It is workforce relationship. It is interpersonal activities within the workplace. This is, this is how we connect. It is connectivity. It is inclusivity. And they give you all these nice terminologies about bridging. We are so unwise that they drag us into the thing. And before you know it, they give you a drink. I say, nothing is wrong. This is not hard drink. This is just a beer. Or this is just a touch. It is not even a full bottle. This is just a small glass of Smirnoff. And here is the orange juice with it. We don't even realize that Satan is using them to cut our necks because we are not wise. We are not discerning. We are unable to assess the situation and know to draw back. So we just gullibly run in. The children of this world are wiser than the children of light. We must turn that script and know how to order our steps and know how, yes, to organize our lives. Do not be drawn in. Beloved, whether it is work, whether it is school, it's a peer pressure at school, it is a wicked thing. And peer pressure causes people to walk out of the presence of God because we're not wise. And once we just allow things to happen and we are not discerning of our environment, the foolish decisions will be made. They'll tell you that your church is a cult. They'll tell you that who you have as elders are not real elders. They'll tell you that they are laws over God heritage and you must come to our church. Where is our church? Oh, we are just some um, spiritual this and that. And what we do, we just come and we just, you know, we don't even open books because Bible is men write that and this is men expressing their philosophies and no, we just depend on the spirit of the Lord and we are spiritualists and God is a spirit and they tell you all that. And before you know it, you're pulled, you start to think and just, I want us to be strong Christians. I want us to be wise as serpents and understand when the devil is at work. Discern and pull back so that you can live to fight another day. It is very important that we understand. Let's go back to the scripture and see. So we say, what is it about the serpent? His ability to assess the situation to to, to, to understand the surrounding, to discern the approach of danger, and to take away himself. That is the wisdom of the serpent. And we must understand that. Now, what is the, what is the uh, innocence of the dove? Having said what we have just said, what is the innocence of the dove? Because we have to understand these things that so that we can apply and appreciate and then apply and then live. The dove is a symbol, first of all, beloved, of the Spirit of God. So where the dove is, we will find peace, we will find calm, we will find serenity, we will find reconciliation. You know why Satan is pulling us away? He, he does not want us to be in that place where we find peace in the Holy Ghost and serenity and calm in the presence of the Lord. No, no, no. Brethren, beloved, is doing some things to the minds. And that's why Paul spoke to the Romans in the scripture that we read earlier on. 
yes, and said, listen to me, I want you to have a heart that pursues God. You see, that heart, that mind, that, that thought, it is serious. It is at the heart of the troubles of the child of God. And we're going to drill down and get to it and then expand on it. So where the dove is, we will find that we can have reconciliation. Yes? So in essence, what that little verse is saying is that we must be wise enough to pull back so that we can appreciate the innocence of the dove. Be wise enough so we can then move out into that space where we can enjoy the peace and the serenity and the reconciliation that the dove represents. What Satan has done is so corrupted the minds of God's people that we are just not at peace. We're not at peace with ourselves. We're not at peace with our brethren. There is this constant internal turmoil. There is this constant thing pushing at our minds that we have done wrong and it is just constantly eating us out. There seems to be no means of reconciling with God. We are just constantly guilty. The thing that happened last month, last year, that we should have dealt with and move on from, it still bothers us today. Somehow we are not able to access the dove and the things that the dove represents. And Satan is always on the move to make sure that we do not experience what comes with being like a dove. The peace and the serenity and the calmness and the reconciliation and, and, and the atmosphere of being in the presence of God. So what we are saying, beloved, we must be wise enough to ensure that we are being salt and we are being light. We must be wise enough to ensure that we are being are moving in the direction of being in the presence of God. Do not let Luke 16 and verse 18 be our reality that the children of this world are wiser than the children of light. It was said, and as we look around, we see it as a fact. But we are saying to this group of people, we are saying to this Faith Chapel, we are saying to this body of believers, anywhere you are, from wherever, whichever body you are a part of, but you are listening to my voice, don't be in that group. Be in the group that is now changing that script. That I'm not going to make no unsaved. Be wiser than me. I want to embrace wisdom. I want to, to, to love it. I, I'm going to buy it today and I will never sell it. I am going to let her pillars uphold me and I'm going to make sure that I do what is right to advance in the kingdom of God. Don't let Luke 16 and verse 8 be your reality, beloved. Now let us look at a very crucial scripture, a scripture that Paul wrote to the Corinthians. It is very significant, it is very powerful, because like the scripture in Proverbs 4 that we read earlier on, yes, like, like the scripture in Proverbs 4 that we read earlier on, it also talks about the mind, or the heart, or the thoughts, same thing. Here is what Paul is saying in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3, but I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Paul is saying that, listen, it is possible for your mind to be corrupted. It is possible for your thought to be corrupted. It is possible for your heart to be corrupted. And that's why the scripture that we read in Proverbs 4 earlier on is so powerful. It says, guard your heart. Yes, 
If we guard our hearts, if we guard our minds, beloved, we are going to know bring into subjection something that is at the heart of why we are so weak and why we are so unwise and therefore why we are walking a lackluster life as a child of God. Yes, it is important to understand that. So you see that mind that Paul is talking about here? It is easy, easy, easy for the adversary to penetrate that mind, that heart, that thought. And that's why we are encouraged and we are admonished to guard it. If Satan, let me tell you how Satan fights Christians. I'm just giving us some points. I'm not even going to, I'm I just telling us what is happening. And it's on the screen there, just for easy reference. I'm telling us what is happening. Satan is fighting you right now. When you find that you come to church, and you, 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 you were quite good when you were at home, even if you were tired, you were quite good. You were quite good as you were coming on the bus, as you're driving, coming. You were quite good. But have you ever noticed, beloved, that no sooner than the worship session starts, you feel like you want to sleep? Have you ever noticed, beloved, when church starts, you, you start to think about what is happening in the business over there that you're doing? You start to sometimes it just come into your memory about what happened at the workplace and you left. Have you ever come to church and you start to think about, yes, you were cooking before you come, and you, you, when you left, as far as you're concerned, you turn off all the burners, but when you're at church, all of a sudden, something hits you and say, you know the burner, the bur you didn't turn it down, you never turn it off? I wonder if we understand, you know, that Satan does things to cause us to be lukewarm? Satan is at the heart of emulation in church when we talk about emulation you have a positive side and you have a negative side but there is a negative side of emulation that the bible speaks about that is at the heart of rivalry the act of imitating and following so if you notice i have here fashion and emulation because you ever notice in church somebody dresses nice and put on a nice hat and somebody sees it and start to talk Whereas they might compliment them. I say, you have on a nice suit or you have on a nice hat and a nice dress. And nothing is wrong with putting on good clothes and dressing up for the Lord and coming to church. When folks were going to the temple to worship God, they bathe and they freshen up and they anoint them, their head with oil and they put on the best garments and so forth. When the king himself was going to go over to the temple, man, it was his regal garment that he put on. Nothing is wrong with putting yourself together and being at your peak physically and spiritually when you come into the presence of the Lord. But we have to be very careful because Satan always, anywhere that he sees something good happening, he's going to come in to try to distort it and to do something to, to, to cause the, the negative evil part to come out. So you just watch the slumber at church. Watch when it's time to pray. You are always fine until you start to pray. You start to fall asleep. Watch it. Watch how you can read everything from the gleaner, from the novel, from the, 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 the harder boys to the novel about any. Watch how you can read chapters upon chapters and stay up. But as soon as you read halfway in one chapter of a book, you, you stop. You flip to a scripture, you look for the shortest one because you want to finish it quickly. But it don't matter if it's two hours it takes to read off something else that is a, a business manual or something leisurely. You just watch it. Where is that coming from? I want to bring to our attention what Satan does. He gets into the mind. He gets into the thoughts. He gets into the heart. And then he does his other things, not only on the inside, having penetrated the mind, but he does things externally. And so he causes rivalry and jealousy and matching up with people and trying to outdo each other. And before we know it, we don't have, we don't even have the mind to worship. Peer pressure in school. Would you believe that Satan, because the people of this world don't even know who they are serving, in the background, behind the scene, he's pushing them to scorn you, 
to laugh at you because he knows that that will break your spirit. He knows that that will break your will. So you see peer pressure in school, you see peer pressure at the home, you see bullying and all those things. This is from the devil. These are the things that he does. And I want us, brethren, to understand the things that he does to get us down. He pushes you. Look here, you're talking about walking by faith. You better look around and reason this thing out and put things together. Because if it's not happening like that, they are hoodwinking you. They are doing, and he pushes you to walk by sight and not by faith. Reason the thing out. I want us to understand, beloved. He desensitizes us to sin and its effects. Did you know that Satan is not working in the church? You see how the Bible says we must not kill? All right, we know that abortion is wrong. And all you folks out there that have done one and two abortions, God is coming at you. So I just dropped that in. But abortion is wrong. And it, you're killing. God knows you from you're in the womb. In fact, he said it, you know. And we know that that child that is in the womb that have conceived and is coming up, that child now is already though he is not in this environment he is in another environment but from the seed and the egg come together and is in that environment in the womb and start to, it is something that you're not supposed to tamper with would you believe that in apostolic christendom folks are now saying oh it is a woman's right to choose when did that come into the church that you can now start to embrace abortion that is from the devil and what it does is desensitize us oh homosexuality don't be judgmental and you have to appreciate people for their particular way of life they were born that way lie this is the work of satan but what is happening subtly and slowly satan is using the schools the universities the, 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 the social environment to desensitize us to things that the bible outrightly calls sin and then what will come as a consequence of those sins and we are now embracing these things and justifying things that the bible abhor and reject and we have to be very careful he brings oppression upon the child and the children of God. Why? They're our lack of getting into the word and knowing where we stand and knowing who the Lord is and what he will do for us. I want us to be very careful. I want us to understand the things that this, the, the devil is doing. We must be mindful. We must be careful. We must be aware of the influences and the experiences, brethren, that affect our emotions and our thoughts. So this is where we're coming to it now as I start to quickly drill down. You see that thought? That mind? You see that imagination? You see that thing that we call the ha Be very careful. Anything that affects you emotionally, that causes that deep internal movement, in emotional internal movement as a result of what you think, as a result of what you hear, as a result of the things that you constantly watch and see, it is going to shape ultimately who you become. The Bible says, as a man thinketh, it means the things that you continue to focus on. It means the thing it means the thing that you continue to pay close attention to. The things that you continue to give your thought life to. The thing that you continue to, you are going to find, beloved, that it determines the kind of person that you become. It determines the thing that you accept as a normal way of life. So follow what I'm saying now, you know, Satan is now getting at you to stop you from becoming the salt of the earth, stop you from becoming the light of the world, and he has a subtle way of doing it, by penetrating the thought or the heart, same thing, getting into the mind and start putting some things there that causes you to embrace things that otherwise you would have known to be wrong and to be against the Bible. He will allow you to embrace homosexuality, lesbianism. He will allow you to embrace abortion. He will allow you to embrace 
polygamy. He will allow you to embrace fornication and say it is okay because we are humans and we have been biologically built and it's God make us. And you start to justify things that the Bible detests. And we must understand that Satan is behind it. And it starts, it don't just happen like that, beloved. It starts by a penetration of the heart, of the mind, of the thoughts. And so the wise man, he said, every step of the way wisdom comes in. The wise man, Solomon, says, listen to me in Proverbs chapter 4. Guard your heart diligently. Watch who you entertain. Watch what you entertain into your space, into your consciousness. Because that is now going to be the thing that ultimately controls you. You are going to develop a manner of life. You are going to accommodate some things. You are going to embrace some things, whether right or wrong, based on the things that you allow to captivate the thought. And you see that thought, that mind, that heart, Paul writing to the same Corinthians, which we're going to get to quickly, is using it to say, listen, that thing can be a stronghold. And a stronghold is something that stands up and opposes the things that are godly and that are right. And Paul, and we're looking at the scripture shortly, uses, he says in that scripture that that thought and that imagination is a stronghold. And that stronghold is at the heart of what affects the child of God. It makes you accept what is wrong and consider it to be right. It makes you accept that criticizing your brethren and tearing down your brethren, it accept it as a norm and say nothing is wrong with it. It shapes the person that you become and it's going to be hard for anybody to convince you otherwise because you have now become a person that believes in a particular thing. And it happens because that stronghold that is in the, the mind, the heart, the thought. And that's why I say, be careful who you embrace and who you bring into your space and who you bring into your heart because he uses people to cause your lights to go out. He uses people to cause your... So you know how many people leave church because somebody poisoned their minds, poisoned their hearts? You know how many persons are now in a state of backsliding because people have gone to them and say this and say that and they have, it, it has reached their mind and it latched into their mind and it becomes a part of them and they just walk away from the presence of the Lord. People have messed up. Be careful, beloved, who you embrace into that space. Be careful what and who you entertain. Yes? Be careful. That is the gist of what is coming out because once you start to do these things, you start to let go of wisdom. Wisdom lets you listen and compare with Bible. The Bereans were very sober because they all, when the apostle came and started to talk, they walked away and they went to the scriptures and searched out the scriptures to see if and that we must be Berean Christians. Don't just take things what people say. That is unwise. That is foolish. And many Christians are backslidden today because they were foolish and we are supposed to be wise as serpents. And this is the trick of the enemy. This is the strategy of Satan to use things, to use people to get to the heart. He knows that he can change your trajectory if he gets to the heart. So the wise man said, guard your heart. Be diligent. Out of it are the issues of life. Who you are, who you become, ultimately is determined by what is happening and what is being manufactured in the heart. 
And that's why Satan wants to captivate the mind. So you see the things that we watch constantly for those who are involved in illicit things and movies that get into carnal this and you see even constantly watching movies that have gun violence and bloodletting and so forth it desensitizes us as Christian people we must be careful what we do because it plays a role in shaping who we are be wise and reject some things be wise and reject some people and reject their arguments and if they're telling you you have people that come and say god tell you te god tell them to tell you to stop take out a tenth of your offering and don't give it to them god tell you that and you are now passing it to them look at your bibles and be wise god tell you this thing in a revelation that you must not do this and you must not go to that place and you must not support that project that the church is doing. And people are foolish enough to listen to a beguiling argument and don't go to the scripture. The scripture that tells us to be supportive of the work of the ministry and be supportive because you're not doing it unto man but you're doing it unto the Lord. The Bible is there but we are not wise and diligent and sober as the Berean Christians in the book of Acts. Who, no matter what they hear, they went to the scripture because we, we preach the other day that the word and everything is in the book. So be very careful what you entertain and who you entertain and how they get to your mind and how they get to your heart. And I want to just go to the slide. I want us to appreciate and understand when we talk about the heart or the thoughts or, or the mind, the imagination, it's all talking about this deep-seated place, we're going to the slide, this deep-seated place in our inner man. We're going to the slide, in our inner man that controls what happens deep within. That heart or that mind or that thought, place where we think, is the literally the command center of the soul. It is a high risk place, you know. It is a vulnerable place. Sin can tamper with that place. That it is with the mind that we serve God. It is with the heart that we serve God. And therefore that command center, which is the mind or the heart, is so crucial. Guard it, beloved, diligently. The true child of God must always be aware of who we are and therefore guard the things that will come to pollute us. Don't lock it off. People that come to pollute us, lock them off. It don't matter if they say they are Christians. Many of them are instruments of Satan. Be careful. So many of God's people who would have otherwise been true children of God are now wayward because they allow things to come from the television and from books that they read and from conversations that they are involved in at work and school. They allow people, even from church, to pollute them. And so they develop a kind of attitude that is bitter, a kind of attitude that is resentful towards things that are holy and right and resentful even to the word of God. And all of a sudden they become lukewarm. It's the strategy of Satan. Why? Because he does not want you to be salt and he does not want you to be light. Yes? And remember, being salt and being light brings glory to God. And we praise him and we magnify him and Satan do all want that. So he's going to try to pollute your heart. And, pol and in polluting the heart and the mind, we don't have the ability to serve God the way that we would normally serve him. Because it is with the mind that we serve God. And a polluted mind cannot serve God. And Satan knows it. So he sets up a stronghold in our lives. Look at what Paul says to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 10 verses 4 to 5. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. 
Look on us. Listen now to this part. Casting down imagination. You know what is imaginations? Things that we think with our minds. And every I think that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. And then watch what he says now. And that's what I'm telling you in the Virgin stronghold, thoughts, imaginations. Here is what he's saying to them now. I want you to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You know why Paul is saying that? He knows that if you leave the thoughts, if you leave the mind, if you expose the heart, you're in trouble. It tends to run away with the things that is coming from external, that is carnal, that is, will tear you down, that will pull you away from the presence of God. He is aware. And he's saying, bring into captivity that heart. In other words, just like Proverbs 4, the wise man Solomon was saying, guard that heart. And, and Solomon said, with all diligence. So with everything that you have got, protect it, defend it, fight for it. Don't let nobody with ill intent get into that space. It is a vulnerable area, beloved. And this is what most saints don't recognize. You might have heard it, but you don't understand the power of protecting your heart and your mind. This is the command center for the soul. Beloved, this is where it happens. And the responsibility is yours to bring into captivity every, the captivity, every thought to the obedience of Christ. If we do not do that, we are exposing ourselves, beloved, to be lukewarm. We are exposing ourselves to be rebellious. We are exposing ourselves to be weaklings. And we are turning away from being who we are supposed to be, salt and light. We are turning away ourselves from being the people who God wants us to be. And then, that being the case, we become weak and feeble, and we don't, I, I don't know how to describe it, but that is, in essence, what Satan is doing. That is the strategy that, that, that he is using to establish strongholds in our mental faculty so that he can control the mind. And if he controls the mind and God is not in control of the mind, then he dictates what happens to you and he dictates the kind of person you become. If you push him out and allow God to have the center stage, God, it is with the mind that we serve God. If he has center stage, then there cannot be a stronghold. And the result of strongholds, destroyed marriages, sicknesses, satanic attacks and oppression, bondages. All of these things come the way of the child of God, which is not supposed to come. Not, and understand when I say sickness, you know, because there are different kinds of sickness. There are sicknesses that are imposed on us by things what the devil put on. And there are sicknesses that just come to us naturally. All of us from time to time have been sick. So we, we, we just want to put that into perspective. And whereas we don't want to be sick, we, we don't have no control over it. And sometimes God heals us, sometimes he don't. We, we become sick when we reach certain ages. Things start to happen. Pressure start to get high. It's, it's, a, it's a part of the aging process. So we must put that into context and understand what I'm saying. But many marriages that are broken today didn't have to be broken. People allow the space that is supposed to be a, a, a santum, that space in the heart and in the mind that is supposed to serve God. We allow Satan to set up a stronghold there and we allow people to feed it with mess and garbage and destroy that space and that space now become controlled by Satan. And that is terrible. That is absolutely terrible. And so saints that's supposed to be on the firing line, saints who are supposed to be victors and not victims, saints who are supposed to be conquerors and not conquered, 
we find that that is happening and that is why many are weak and that is why many have lost their saltness and that is why many have lost their glow. It is as simple as that. It's not that you just get up and say, I don't want to be a salt anymore. No, you still come to church. You still get involved. But the saltness is not there and the light is dim. Something is happening. What has happened? This is what we have feel to see and I'm bringing it to our attention again as we close we have allowed Satan to take over the space that space which we call the heart or the mind that we use to worship God we have allowed it to become infiltrated and if it is infiltrated by Satan he is going to inject bitterness, rebellion. He's going to inject the things that we don't pray and therefore we become lukewarm. Inject things that we don't read the Bible. You watch what happens to you. Can you feel it? You see it? You know it? When we don't pray and don't fast and we don't read the word and we don't apply the word and we don't let our light shine and we don't salt the place, we become weak. So we are here, but we are not here. Well, I've exposed it. So, beloved, last week we looked at salt and light. And we see the kind of people that God wants us to be. This week, having exposed it, we look at how we can position ourselves so that we become and remain salted and lit. And the way to do it is to guard our hearts protect the sanctum of our minds and our hearts because this is how Satan make headway into our space and turn us upside down. Jesus said, listen to me, be wise as serpent, be armless as dove. The wise man, having heard this, is going to take steps to protect and to guard the heart diligently. Be wise so that you can discern that folks are after you to tear you down. Conditions around you are established to tear you down. Be wise as a serpent and discern these things and assess these things and know how to pull back and guard your heart. And don't let the people of this world be wiser than you. Be wise enough to lock out carnality and lock out... Um, pornography and lock out the naysayers and lock out those who are inciting you to leave the presence of God. Lock them out and guard your hearts. Get back to that place where God floods the soul, the spirit, the mind, the thought, the heart, the command center. Let him be in charge. And I guarantee you, your saltness will return and you will influence men and not the other way around where men influence you. You will light this world and nothing can put a basket or a bucket or a bushel over that light. It will be like a lighthouse that the ship out sea look on and say, hey, ship ahoy. And you know that they are guided and they know that the land is just over yonder. You will be a great lighthouse. So I charge the children of God. I charge the people of God. I charge the true child of God. You are supposed to be salt. Be who you are meant to be. You're supposed to be the light of the world. Be who you are supposed to be. Yes, you can be salt, the salt of the earth. Yes, you can be light, the light of the world. That's what you are meant to be. Don't make Satan stop you. Don't make him use his guile and all the other things and get into your heart space and pollute it and weaken you, and mess you up as a child of God. You can defend against that by being wise. Wise as a serpent, armless, innocent as a dove. Pick from the serpent what you can get and throw away the rest. Get into the space of the dove and let peace and serenity and reconciliation flood your space. And you will be the best. I, I'm not asking you. I am telling you, it is as simple as I just told you. Nothing big, no rocket science, nothing more. 
It is as simple as what I just presented to us. Be the best you can be. You're a child of God. You're destined for greatness. You're destined for heaven. You're destined to be in the presence of God. But make sure you're following suit with what the Bible has outlined for us to do and be what the Bible wants us to be, the salt of the earth, the light of the world. God bless you tonight in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Can we bow our heads? Father in heaven, we come one more time before your presence and we thank you for another Bible study. We thank you, mighty God, for being with us, for leading us as we present the word. I pray that you will help us as children of God to be the best that we can be, to be the salt of the earth, to be the light of the world. Help us, Lord, to see and to understand that Satan wants to dim our lights and to take away our flavoring. But if we be wise and if we understand the wiles and the strategies of Satan that he wants to get into our hearts so that he can control that space because we are at war, then mighty God, I pray that you will bring this to our attention and bring this to the forefront of our minds and have us to be wise as serpents and take the steps that we must take so that we can guard and protect the command center and reserve it for the presence of almighty God alone. We thank you, we bless you. And I pray that this word, this Bible study tonight, last week and tonight, for those who missed last week, may they catch on. For those who are here tonight, Father God, let them follow through and put them together because although they are two, they are one. And let this oneness penetrate into our system and penetrate and spread out across our Christian walk so that we can be better Christians. We can be the true children of God. Have your own way. Dismiss us now with your blessings. Bless your people tonight. I cover them in the name of the Lord Jesus. I ask you to lead and direct. We give you thanks, mighty God, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise God. Praise God. The Lord wish to bless you, beloved. Thanks again for being in Bible study. And God's willing, next week, same time, we continue with Bible study as we drill into other areas that will teach us how to be the best that we can be. That is what it's all about. And I want all of us, every single one of us, to make it on that great day. Let's get into the word, keep in the word, and live for Jesus. God bless you tonight in Jesus' name. See you in church on Sunday, every one of you. And those who haven't been out in a while, you got to be out. We are having some great move of God. And God is just with us. And I want us to be in church and to, to, to embrace the presence of the Lord and be the best that we can be. God bless you tonight. In Jesus' name. Amen.